live. Mission log number 238. It's about empowering you. The most powerful healer in the world is your own pharmacy. Like our, what we make as a painkiller is 10 to the ninth power stronger than morphine, which is our strongest drug we've got for pain management. Far stronger is what your own body makes. So we want to spend more time. How do we activate the body's own healing system, own antibacterials, antiviral, all the molecules that we possess in our body are far more powerful, stronger, and more accurate than any drug. It's the right dosage in the right moment with no side effects. Why would we not be wanting to activate that? Even if you're doing other therapies, you always want your body's own pharmacy involved. Welcome to Stellar Life Podcast. Get inspired and live out loud. From love, freedom, and success to having it all. Here's your host, coach, speaker, and shining star, Orion. Roger, you're looking good. Hello and welcome to Stellar Life Podcast. The issue of health is something that has been a big concern, especially in the last year. And I was always into alternative medicine. I eat organic I look for different modalities. I have great respect for the mainstream medicine. I don't think, I mean, there are things that you cannot cure with herbs and you do need to go through a surgery. And I do believe that there is so much knowledge in many ancient modalities and new technologies. And when you combine all those modalities together, you can really help the patient thrive. Just like me as a coach, I don't do just one model. The Orion's method is something that is a combination of numerous modalities that I've been studying. And when I coach someone, I give them what they need. I use the modality that I am feeling guided to help them with, whether it might be hypnosis, it might be NLP, it might be whatever they need at that moment, that will be something that I will help them with. And I think this is the best way is that when a doctor see a patient and they don't give them the cookie cutter answer, but a tailor made treatment, something that is specific to that person looking not only at the symptoms, but the core of the problem and looking at the mind body connection and different ways to help that person. So one extremely extraordinary doctor is Dr. Donis Warden. She is the female face of medicine. She's an award-winning physician, researcher, and global health educator who expertly and compassionately, she's very compassionate and very kind, bridges the world of conventional allopathic and advanced alternative medicine. As a naturopathic medical doctor, she's licensed in prescribing both pharmaceuticals and nutraceuticals. Her passion is in helping people take charge of their health and make informed decision. And it's beautiful to see how she combines both approaches, where she can give you the allopathic solution and also treat you with all those other different modalities. And doing so, she's also... I feel very spiritually connected. And I think that doctors who are in tune with their patients are the most successful ones. And she's very successful. So enjoy this extraordinary interview. And now, without further ado, on to the show. Two, one, zero, Hi, Dr. Warden, and welcome to Stellar Life Podcast. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Orion. I'm so excited to be on your podcast. What a, a great wealth of information that you provide. So happy to be here. Oh, thank you. And you're pretty amazing. And, and I, I'm curious, I mean, this conversation is going to be really good because you're not only doing the traditional medicine, you're also combining alternative medicine and you are so interesting. You have so many sides to you and, and so many ways to teach people and heal people in, in a way that is very holistic. And it's rare because it's sometimes we dissect 
people and we treat them by body parts and, and we're not, we don't treat them as a whole. So what you're doing is very, very beautiful and very amazing. Grateful to be able to do it. You know, it's just an honor for me to, you know, as a researcher to gather knowledge constantly and be able to look at that wholeness of a person. It's just a, a, an honor to be able to work with people that way. Yeah. And I'm glad there are people like you in the world. We need so many more of those. <laughs> <laughs> Before we begin, can you please share about your passion and how did you get to combine traditional and alternative medicine? Right. Well, as a naturopathic medical doctor and in Arizona, I'm licensed to you know, prescribe medicine, to do minor surgery. So we're primary care. So I understand the medicines and we're also licensed in nutrition, clinical nutrition from IVs to what we really need to be doing with gut and brain health. But we're also licensed in homeopathy in traditional Chinese medicine and acupuncture in manipulation, similar to what a chiropractor or a, a DO used to do. And many other avenues that we were licensed in to be able to look at that whole. So when I'm working with someone, the first thing is diagnostics, what's really the root of the problem. And then there's many ways to treat alternative and traditional. And sometimes it's, I think we've gotten stuck into thinking we have to take sides. We have to say, don't tell your real, you know, your traditional real doctor about alternative things you're doing because they'll think it's out there with no science. And on the other hand, the uh, alternative guys are saying, don't do any of the traditional because, you know, it's toxic and it'll kill you. And I think we really need a voice of reason in the middle and find out what's really affecting the person from a holistic standpoint, and that is mind, body, soul, all of it, emotional, mental, all of it, find out that. And then we can talk about the treatments that are available and that really the person identifies with, because I'm a big believer, whatever you choose for your treatment is the best one, because if you're confident in it and you believe in it, then your body's own pharmacy is at work because you're in that parasympathetic relaxed state. So all of your chemicals, neurotransmitters, all that kick in and that health healing is available. And I have this conversation with my oncology, you know, cancer patients all the time. It's not what I would choose. It's what after you're educated and you understand your, what's going on, what your options are, everything that's out there that's credible out there. And I provide that. Then really, it's up to the patient to choose. Mm. I've been curious lately about homeopathy. And I mean, how does it work? It's so mysterious to me. <laughs> it is. And it's really come under the gun. In, first, in the United States, it's regulated as a drug. Uh, you know, if we take nutraceuticals or supplements, they're regulated as foods. And so it's a little easier for them to get out there and do some things. But homeopathy is regulated as a pharmaceutical drug. And it's it's interesting how that's happened. But it's coming under scrutiny now all over the world. Homeopathy has been a wonderful adjunctive therapy. And I still utilize some of it in my practice. But homeopathy is, to make it simple, it's called light cures like. So if you take a very, very low dose of something that normally would cause a symptom, let's say you take Ipecac. Ipecac is something you take. If somebody took something poisonous and you want them to vomit, you give them Ipecac to do that. But homeopathy is a very, very, very diluted dosage of Ipecac. And in that instance, you use it for someone who's nauseated and vomiting to turn it off. So it's kind of like a vaccine. It gives a tiny little bit of information to the body to say, oh, I need to pay attention and stop that symptom. So it's opposite, completely opposite of a pharmaceutical where we're trying to block or uh, regulate a symptom. Homeopathy is giving the low dose of something that would normally make you sick, kind of like a vaccine. So what's the problem? Why do people scrutinize it? Uh, because of the science. There's not enough research behind it. I mean, there is some, and worldwide there is some, but nobody's put a lot of money behind it to do the research because it's inexpensive medicine. And if there's not a revenue to make around it, like Boron is the largest homeopathic manufacturer in the world. They flew me out, uh, when was that, last year? 
to their facility in France. They're wonderful people. It's been used in Europe a lot. But, you know, and they've done, you know, they've tried to help in education and in studying. They flew me out and I had them fly out one of the oncologists from MD Anderson that were using some homeopathy for side effects of their traditional care. So they've tried, but nobody's put, I will say, enough of the science or the medicine behind it to make it valid in the in the world of insurance and reimbursement. It's about money. It's always about money. That's what yeah, it seems to me course. like yeah. <laughs> whatever's going on in the world today is all about money. So there is homeopathy that you use. And you also told me they use frequency medicine. What is that? I do. So I've lectured and taught this biomedical type of medicine to physicians for probably more than 18 years. Cold laser is one. So we know low-level lasers are used for burn and wound uh, management. In fact, I'm a co-author on a study that we're developing right now at MD Anderson to utilize in, I can't talk about the particulars of the study yet, but it will be used for radiation burns. So frequency medicine, using light and sound and all that has always been a passion of mine. And I've lectured on what do we really know and what do we not? Unfortunately, there's a lot of, I'll say, urban myths out there to say this frequency does this or cures that. We've got to be really careful with that. My mentor in this space is Dr. Bill Tiller who for 40 years was the chair of the physics department at Stanford. He's still emeritus professor, and he and I lectured on laser physics. I was using it in medicine, and we had him there to talk about the physics of how it all works. And, of course, everybody went, what did he just say? And I got to say, well, this is how you use it in practice. So frequency medicine, there's different devices that I've used over the years. I think it's the wave of the future. I can't wait for us to learn and do more. But once again, Someone has to fund and do the studies so it can become more mainstream. And, you know, light and sound, there's not a lot of money behind that. But some of the devices have done some studies. And I'm anxious to do this one in MD Anderson to give at least low-level lasers or cold lasers a place. Mm. So frequency medicine is also sound waves, right? It is. And interesting, there's a whole show that we could do on that. And I will tell you, Interesting that an MRI study showed that it was a group of researchers said, okay, you guys are saying acupuncture can heal. So they said, if that's true, let's work on vision and let's see what you would do. So the acupuncturist in the study said, all right, the vision where we would put it in the meridian is a needle in the bottom of the foot. So then that that didn't translate to traditional medicine. Well, if that's true, it should light up in the brain. It's the back part of your head in the occiput. It should light up that area if you're truly affecting a vision part. Well, not only did it light up there, but then they looked at from the needle, what would happen if we did like a laser did light? Light got there faster on the same point. And guess what was even faster than that? Sound. But that doesn't mean it's better. It just means it traveled more quickly. And my husband, uh, Barry Goldstein, that works with some of the largest thought leaders and and people out there from, you know, Joe Dispenza to Neil Donald Washington, right, all that, his music and the science that he puts behind that has been amazing. And so we we work with music in uh, trying to uh, help people get to the emotion where they need to be. That would be a great interview for you to do at some point. He does a lot of them. And it's just Mm -hmm. fascinating what we can do with music, because now we've got a non-invasive way to really help people and to get their mind and emotion to a state. And remember, when it's in peace and calm, then the body can heal. A big advocate, you know, what can we do that's less invasive? I do regenerative injections. I've taught that for years, all these leading edge things, and they're fun and great. But the first step always, can we help the body heal itself? Oh, beautiful. I have a, how old is he now? He's a year and five months, my my sweet baby. And (laughs) it's so cute. And I planned a beautiful home birth in the water. I actually wanted to experience orgasm while giving birth. Like that was my ideal. Yeah. And I was fully like full opening for 12 hours and he was breech. And I had, I had a, a doctor, a special doctor there that delivers breech babies. And the whole part at home was really beautiful. But after 12 hours, he just didn't want to, he didn't want to <laughs> drop. 
So we, and they didn't know what to do. And I had to go to the emergency uh, room and get a C-section and going from this beautiful atmosphere to, to meeting this like super tired doctor and cranky and, <laughs> and, uh, oh my God, it was horrible. And like the whole thing was traumatic. So I'm, I'm left with this scar and I've, I've been told that because of the scar, because they cut through so many layers, there is nerve damage. And so the body is compensating. There are different muscles that are trying to stabilize the, the hips and the core and the, and the core doesn't even engage because uh, there is nerve damage and that sound wave can, can help break it and heal it and activate those nerves. Right. Well, and very, very true there. I was just uh, commiserate with you a little bit. My beautiful baby is 30 years old and I had the (laughs) same experience. I planned it all, read it all, all natural, (laughs) breach, had to have the C-section. So Uh what I will say is we've got to be very thankful for modern medicine, you know, and some of that scar that you've got there, um, there's an emotion attached to that as well. Mm -hmm. And we found that in scar therapy. I studied with the Germans an injection technique for scar therapy. And part of it was having the patient speak about what happened and what emotions they had when that scar was being placed there, whether it was a car accident or a C-section. And those emotions attached to that scar, when you release that while you're doing this this injection technique is profound. So I want to always bring back that we need to be grateful for modern medicine, traditional medicine. In America, we've got the best emergency care around now, when it comes to chronic degenerative diseases, we are a miserable failure and it, no one would, we, the stats show it. But when it comes to emer- emergency, we say thank you to that tired emergency room doctor, right, to be grateful for it. But what I would suggest to you, and I've worked on many scars, you can probably find someone, it's called neural therapy. And we, some of us that worked in injections, we would use homeopathy, but even with that homeopathy, they can use a topical anesthetic and inject into that scar like it's new. And if they're doing the types of techniques I'm talking about and having you talk about the sadness and the grief that you had around that scar, because you didn't get to have that vision come through, <laughs> right? That, that, right, that you are able to let go of all the pieces that are attached to that scar, not just that scar tissue. There are devices like the cold laser I mentioned, Santa Key out of Australia. There are all kinds of devices can help break up that scar tissue and work on those underlying areas that you're talking about. But just the scar injection alone on that topical part can release all that underlying as well. So those are just some hints for you to, to consider. Wow, thank you. That's amazing. And I like what you said about being super grateful because for a while there, I was resentful. I was Mm -hmm. so resentful and I had to come to terms with it and say, wow, thank you. Okay. So she wasn't the most, you know, she didn't like to smile and she was kind of (laughs) cranky, but without her, I wouldn't have my baby. And I like what you're saying. Like we need to be able to to go through a C-section because all the herbs in the world cannot heal that, cannot do this. (laughs) That's right. And we should always be bridging everything in our lives. Traditional, I've always said, we. why do we have to take sides? Why would we have to choose traditional over alternative and integrative even? People say they're integrative. They, you know, we really lean, we like to lean natural and that's great. But why choose sides? It's what's best for the patient in that moment and not forgetting that the patient's own belief system is very big here, that we have to take not what the doctor believes always, but what the patient believes. You have to take all of that into account. And I love that part of my mission is to bridge those worlds for us to be grateful for all of it, not to challenge it, not to not challenge it, I should say. We need to challenge both sides to their weaknesses and their strengths and weaknesses. I've got a show that I signed and we're trying to find the best home for it, but it's health hot seat where I'm in the middle and we've got a traditional doctor on one side and an alternative medicine on the other side that are really stuck and believe their way is the only way. And people need to hear it. They need just need to hear what the sides are saying all at once instead of us hiding between each one and not talking about it. I want to bring it to the forefront. We're having that discussion where people can hear it all at once. And my part in the middle is pulling out 
the truth and the weaknesses from both sides, but also reminding the patient, after you're educated, it's up to you to make that decision. Why is it so important to give them the power? Because we've been educated to give the doctors the power. The doctors know a little of us. What do we know? We know nothing. Any, anyone that wears white robe is smarter than us. And we need to give them the power and the decision. And you're doing something different where you empower the patient. And you're like, listen, you have the power. Your mind is a pharmacy and you can create healing. That's right. And I tell patients all the time because I work in a lot of space from oncology to, uh, you know, you name it to professional athletes, but, but every DC state. And I always say, well, they say, well, my other doctor said, and I I don't feel they're listening to me. And I feel dumb. And I say, you know what? They work for you. Fire them. You are paying a doctor for their medical expertise. They are not God. They are not this. They are hopefully doing their best with what they have in their brain. But what they have in their brain is not the full picture for anyone. So I always empower patients, fire anybody that you're working with, from a doctor to a healer to a acupuncturist. If you do not feel comfortable, how do you think your body's going to heal in that state? Mm, Powerful. So empower them to fire. And they're like, can I fire my doctor? And I said, Absolutely, you can fire them. We'll find another one. We want a team. We want a healthcare team that works together for whatever. Get the egos out of the way, both sides, and say, you know, tell tell the alternative medicine, stop telling the patient they can't take this drug in this moment because it's toxic if the patient needs it or feels that they need it. So it's about empowering you, the most powerful healer in the world is your own pharmacy. Like our, what we make uh, as a painkiller is 10 to the ninth power stronger than morphine, which is our strongest drug we've got for pain management. Far stronger is what your own body makes. So we want to spend more time. How do we activate the body's own healing system, own antibacterials, antiviral, all the molecules that we possess in our body are far more powerful stronger and more accurate than any drug. It's the right dosage in the right moment with no side effects. Why would we not be wanting to activate that? Even if you're doing other therapies, you always want your body's own pharmacy involved. Mm. So how do you empower your patients? What kind of tools do you give them to engage the power of their minds? You know, I think a lot of them, it depends on how they're coming in. If they're a professional athlete, they're already on top of the game. They say, make me faster, better and stay at the game longer. Right. You know, their their minds are powerful already. They have stress and anxiety. So we have to work on whatever it is as that personalized medicine and what that patient needs. A lot of cancer patients are coming in in fear. They're anxious. They're fearful. And, you know, others are coming in in grief. They've lost an arm and a leg. They're in pain. They're, you know, it depends on the emotion. So that's how I start is where is that patient emotionally? They say, do you work with this disease or that? The answer is yes. It's people say, what do you specialize in? And I say health. It's take that patient I'll look at all the physical. I'm a good diagnostician. I I have people that come from Barrows and Mayo and everywhere. They've had all these diagnostic tests and nobody can figure them out. I love that patient. I'll get that figured out. But the most important is where's that patient in that moment? Do I need to empower them and give them hope and health? Or do I need to calm them down and say, here's your morning program and evening program. This is how you need to go to sleep. This is how you need to wake up. And here are the tools that you will use. Is it music? Is it a supplement? Is it a a food? Is it a certain type of exercise or diet? It's not, I do not have a protocol. Everybody that comes in gets the same protocol. It's not how I do medicine. It's so unique with each patient. The same different people could come in with the same disease state. Let's say rheumatoid arthritis. People say, how do you treat it? I said, don't know. I haven't seen the patient. I have many tools on both sides from traditional to alternative, that's the easy part. Choosing the treatment is the easy part. It's diagnosing what all the things that needs to happen in that patient. And you have to address all those levels that we've talked about, that you talk about, all the levels. So when you diagnose, do you feel like you're working with a superpower? You're working with something that is more spiritual and more connecting to God, creation, life force? 
Yes. And so on my intake for 20 years, I mean, I've been asking questions that nobody was asking. I say, do you have a spiritual practice? And I said, I'm not asking about religion. Don't care. That's not it. I'm asking the patient, do they feel connected to something greater than themselves? That is my opportunity to open the door to have a conversation with the patient and connect with them on that level. Patients that come to me from, like, they've seen an interview on Gaia, or now they're going to hear from your interview because you're spiritually connected, they're already there. And I can start that conversation with them right at the beginning, and I tap in whether they're connected or not. My best work always is we've forgotten that physician and doctor means healer and teacher. That's what those mean. We have forgotten that in medicine. So if I am connected in that space, I will always have a better connection with the patient. Or I do consults that are not patients, so they don't have to fly in to see me. I do these Zoom or Skype and do these things. So whatever they are with me, however I'm helping with them, Sometimes I can't mention spirituality right up top. They'll be afraid and panic and and leave. So I have to wait when they're filling out that questionnaire. I ask them that. But I I have to guide slowly sometimes. And other times I say, tap in. What are you feeling? Are you connected with this? What do you feel is happening with you? And those that are spiritually connected, it's very interesting. They usually will know on a higher level what's causing the physical manifestations that they're suffering with. They already know it. But sometimes we have to relieve those physical problems so that they can have the opportunity to feel spiritually connected because they're so much in pain or so much distress, they're having a hard time getting there. So, you know, it's just very personalized. And yes, to answer your question, very important for me to be in my connected state to work with anybody, even if it's virtual on these video conferences, you still can feel and hear the energy coming from someone and and work with them at that level. So some are ready to have that conversation. Some aren't. That's okay. I eventually get them there. And I, sometimes through laughter. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes you, you just got to take them where they are in their journey, in their life journey. That's beautiful. When I work with clients, I do, A, I pray that I'll be a channel and, and the right words will come out and they'll say the right things. But if I get stuck, I always take a moment and I breathe and the answers always come. And I say things that I, I don't even know where they're coming from, but they're coming, <laughs> they're helping, they're moving, they're shaking. So I really believe in this connection. Yes. And we all have it in teaching the patients that they have it too. You know, it's, it's, we all have it, but we've disconnected. So we are so disconnected as a society then giving that that power back is the best thing that I can do as a physician and a teacher. But in the meantime, I tell them I'll dink around on the physical level and I'm good. <laughs> and I will I will get there. But, you know, just reminding them that the true healing is going to be at a, at a higher level. Yes. So we're going through a pandemic and it's a pandemic of stress and fear and anxiety and I just read today that I'm in Israel right now and the suicidal rates, the kids that are more suicidal is like 42% and it's, it's crazy. It's really, really crazy. There is so much fear, so much anxiety. You know, it's either people are afraid of, of COVID-19 and they're afraid to get sick. Mm -hmm. And the people that are on the other side are so afraid of all the conspiracy theories because they see the darkness of what's going on and the game that is behind the game. So Everybody's afraid. I just feel like, like not everybody, but a lot of people are in stress and fear. And here in Israel, there is a mask mandate. So if I walk down the street and I see people like correcting their masks on, on their, on their nose or walking in the nature, <laughs> covering their face and pretty insane. Like people are in fear. And uh, Dave Asprey, said yeah. because I am I, I don't believe masks work because the science that I read that the virus can travel through them so it doesn't do much but I heard from a Dave Asprey who said wear it not to scare the muggles so if you know the muggles from Harry Potter the people that yeah yeah don't have the the ability to see magic I wear it to not scare people or respect people but I'm, I don't think it protects me or anyone else. Well, 
that's where in time we will know a little bit more about it. But right now, just being the physician that I am, I know that even if now I'm not going to say that I don't I think there's any mask out there that will 100 percent block all virus transmission. Okay, I will say that. But what if it blocks a little bit? We know that the more dosage you get, if somebody coughs immediately in your face and you get a bunch of that virus bug, your body has to mount a quicker, more robust response to that than if they were across the room and you just got a few little particles. So in my mind, as a physician and what I know about that, if I can reduce the amount of the viral load coming in, Mm -hmm. I think it's worth wearing a mask. So I'm not telling the anti-maskers that they have to do it. I don't think anybody should, you know, really be mandated this and that. But I think out of respect for those that are in the fear and the worry, why not? What harm does it do for you if you have to go in somewhere to throw on a little mask for a minute to not cause everybody in the area that you're at to be panicked and angry and because you're not wearing the mask? Yeah, I'm not. I'm, I'm talking more about. I'm talking more about people that are driving alone in their car. I with, know, I know. Or the people who, like, you know, running through through a field. Yeah, and like, yeah. When I'm not near and I walk my dog, the mask is off. And yeah, yeah we, we, we can. And, you know, there's so many strains right now that are coming out that are different. That's what viruses do. They morph. For us to think that one vaccine is going to fix it all, I just think is naive thinking. Does it mean that that vaccine or a vaccine couldn't be helpful? Again, we don't know enough about it. It was brought very, they were brought very quickly to market. We don't have the typical science and longevity that we normally do. So when patients ask me about it, I say, don't know. We don't know enough. That's what I know at this point. We don't know enough. Long-term safety, pregnant women. I have my pregnant patients saying, should I get it? Should I not? None of the studies were done on pregnant women to see what it does with the fetus. So maybe it would be helpful. Maybe they would be worse off getting COVID than than the vaccine, even if the vaccine would be protective. We, you know, we don't know all of that yet. So the answer is we don't know. Yeah. So here in Israel, is this like the testing lab of the world and people are running and pushing in line to, to get the vaccine and and I've, I've heard about, you know, it, it doesn't, it's not being broadcast in mainstream media, but I've heard of people that died and got all kinds of side effects that are for life and, and horrible. And here they want to vaccinate everyone, the men, you know, pregnant women, children, babies, everyone. I'm afraid of that. But I want to focus more on on that fear that I have. So I'm afraid of vaccine. Somebody else will be afraid of somebody not taking the vaccine. So all, all this fear and stress and anxiety, what do you recommend to do with it? Like, how do you recommend channeling it and releasing it and, and dealing with it? Like knowing what we know and still, you know, keeping sane. <laughs> That's right. What we don't know is the biggest piece. You know, we there's so much we still don't know. So I, I would say first understanding is the fear and the worry. Is it about your health, the health of a loved one? Is it a financial situation or a job? You know, support services. Where is the fear? Is it the fear about getting sick? And identifying where your fear is coming from. Where are all the fears? And really focusing on where is it coming from and that what's it causing? Is it causing a change in your sleep pattern or your eating patterns? Do you have difficulty concentrating? Are your chronic health problems that generally bother you a little bit really worse? How's your mental health? Are you anxious? Are you depressed? Identify these things. Are you doing more tobacco or alcohol or other substances? The rate of, you know, anyone with addiction problems is really rising and is worse. So the first is identify it understand it and then know, are you a rigid thinker to start with? So what does that mean? Uh, Rigid thinkers are creatures of habit that, you know, they really get bent out of shape when things don't go their way or when a routine is upended. As neuroscientists, that trait is referred to as cognitive inflexibility. So it's the inability to roll with the ups and downs of everyday life let alone in a pandemic. So if you are already a rigid thinker, that's who you kind of are, they're going to have more anxiety 
moodiness, frustration, and irritability. And again, that's just kind of an identifying who you were to start with. Were you either free spirit to start with, didn't really have any worries, did really well, or you were already (laughs) this creature of habit. Then giving yourself a break to understand who you were to start with. And the thing that I like is keeping people into the idea that no government, No vaccine, no medication is really going to be a 100% cure for anything and all things ever. It's about our own immune systems. It's about taking care of our bodies. And if you've been waiting to start exercising or eating healthy or start doing meditation to relax, to get your brain waves into the right state, if you've been waiting to do that, you're never going to have a better time than right now because It's up to you. Now is our time to say, okay, I'm going to turn around this pandemic, fear, anxiety thing and say, this is a wake up call and I'm going to use it personally as a way to get myself where I need to be anyway, spiritually connected, physically doing all the things. So turn it around and say, okay, uh, now's the time to focus on self care. Yes, you want to support others around you, but you've got to take charge of your health. And now is the time. So how do we do that? There are very basics. They can work with alternative doctors, integrative doctors, because they're going to be more along the line of working on all these levels. But we know that if we're firing up those emotional centers in the brain that make us anxious and stressed and depressed, that affects our immune system. How can your immune system even take the information from a vaccine and do what it needs to do if your immune system is not able to. It's got to be in decent shape for a vaccine to work anyway. That's why vaccines typically are less effective in older patients because their immune system's already compromised. So we've we got to make sure that we're doing that. So we, what can we be grateful for? And this is what I have people focus on. What can you be grateful for? What can you do? You can't, Take care of all these other things outside of our control, but you can exercise. You can eat healthy. You can find a new hobby or new friends. You can eat right to think right. (laughs) You can take breaks from family feuds. Those old things that are hanging on, is it time to heal it or to let it go? Sometimes you have to say, I'm done. I'm not going to be speaking to this person because every time I do, even if they're family, it causes stress and anxiety. And just starting new traditions within your world of family and friends. Keep happy, healthy, old traditions in place, things that you might do, or start new ones every Sunday. A lot of people are doing, you know, a Zoom call with their family. But if that's causing stress, (laughs) that's no longer helpful. So identifying how do we boost serotonin naturally? So let's talk about serotonin. That helps us with our negative thoughts our behaviors, which as we're discussing in the long run, helps our overall body health, our our overall immune system. What are the things that can boost serotonin? The I'm happy, okay hormone, the one that we want. (laughs) It's exercise, bright light exposure, get out in sunlight, eating tryptophan foods like turkey and eggs or chickpeas, nuts, seeds, seafood, Quinoa, sweet potatoes, looking at what are the foods that are that you like that are within your dietary program that you are eating tryptophan containing foods. And there are some natural supplements that can help people. And they're all tools. The other is music. There's nothing faster that can take you to a state of happiness. Think about happy song right now. Think like, what's your happy song? And the minute you think about that song. And if you haven't identified one, we should, but identify it, you immediately feel happy and all your chemicals, everything's doing good. Or what's the type of music that can relax your brain, get you ready for sleep? What, what's the type of music that can, when you're upset and you're angry or you're grief, what is the song or the type of music that can get you there? Think about pet therapy. I mean, great. If you've ever thought about maybe getting a dog or a cat, now's a great time. (laughs) And they're great. We can bond together and relax together. There are CDs called Pet Waves that help you bond with your pet. So it's to relax you and the pet. 
And then reading or listening to books, a couple of shout outs. I'll say Miracle Mornings, How Elrod Breathe by James Nestor is one of the best books out there right now. James is a good friend. It's called Breathe. You mentioned that you do your breathing to get connected. This is a great, fantastic, fun read. It gives you the science, but he's a beautiful journalist and just a great book. People are loving it. And it teaches you why it's important to breathe a certain way, what it does in your body and the different ways to breathe. Uh, Another one is the secret language of the heart. That one is about using music, developing playlists for emotions. What do you need right now? I love that. Yeah. So that's Barry again, Barry Goldstein. I have to give the shout out. He is my husband, but I know why the top thought leaders out there utilize him for all of their, not just the music that he creates, but the products he develops with them because he's heartfelt and he's science-based and it's just, why aren't we using music more? We should be. But breathing and music, exercise and food, those are your main things. And then meditation practices. Those are important. And then there's certain supplements I find that can be helpful. Mm. Would you like to get into the supplements? We can. We can. But again, I, I tell, I always say more is not better. When patients come to me and they bring in a bag full of supplements, if you're on more than five or six things, I go, you know what? Your poor liver and your kidney are going, what in the world are you doing? And you have no idea how they work with one another. Neither do your doctors. We don't know. So more is not better. It's got to be personalized what's really going on. But in general, in general, uh, the B vitamins uh, can work very well. I would suggest that people get tested for the MTHFR gene. That is a gene that um, has to do with methylation. And if you take a regular B vitamin, it can make you worse. So you get a methylated B vitamin. So if you don't want to Mm -hmm. test, just get methylated B vitamins a controlled release melatonin. So new hormone testing that we have that allows us to see all the pathways. It's new. We've not been able to see this. We're looking at cortisol and melatonin and then all the sex hormones. We can see the pathways, where they're going and how they're connecting. And we're finding that if you just take melatonin, plain melatonin right before you go to bed, it's not lasting through the night. People are still waking up at 3 a.m. I wake up at 3 a.m. all the time. But I also co-sleep with my baby. <laughs> I, that's right. I'm gonna. I want to talk about that 3 a.m. in a minute. It's pretty interesting time. Controlled release means a little bit of melatonin all night long, and it's been helpful. We use it in cancer patients. This and that. Omega threes. The fish oils are just good brain food. If you've got busy, active mind, you can't shut off phosphatidylserine and GABA, and then. Not forgetting, and again, a whole nother topic, but probiotics. What do we know about the mind-body connection? I just gave a four-hour seminar to a group connected with Cedar sinai of psychiatrists and people in mental health. And the more we know about that brain and that gut connection, we know you've got to get that gut health under control and get it working well for the brain and the emotions and the mental to work well. And I love that topic. Lots of information there, but making sure that you've got your gut health working really well. And that that's that's very important. So do you want to go back to the 3 a.m. real quick? Because I think you'll find it interesting. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Yeah. So two reasons why we find cortisol is part of that. So on this new testing that we've got, we can be able to see, are you having a cortisol spike at 3 a.m.? That means that you're dreaming or you're breaking through your subconscious, all the stuff that you're worrying about during your day. Mm -hmm. You haven't let it go before you go to sleep. You think you have because you fall asleep. You can go to sleep, but your brain's still up there in this wild, crazy, non-coherent pattern. It's all wackadoodle, right? And it's not incoherent, smooth, slow, the way it's supposed to be. You go to sleep, but because it's still there, you still haven't resolved the fear and the anxiety that you have during your day. You break through. The cortisol comes up and cortisol, that rhythm, natural rhythm, if it's high at 3 a.m., you're going to wake up. But another interesting part is that on the Chinese medicine clock, and people can look this up, it's been around for thousands of years, Chinese medicine. And so we've got to look back and say, what do the ancients know? And if you look at from uh, 1 to 3 a.m. disturbance, if you're waking up between 1 and 3 a.m., it's the liver channel. And in Chinese medicine, the emotion that it's attached to that is anger. So if we're angry about 
having to wear a mask or not wear a mask, if we're all the things we could be angry about, right? So one to 3 a.m. is unresolved anger. You went to sleep, you were still upset. If it's three to 5 a.m., it's grief. And it could be grief from childhood. It doesn't have to be something right now. But maybe it's childhood or maybe you're grieving. You can't go to happy hour with the girls. But if you have not done your work during the day, the chances are that you're going to wake up along those time periods. And people that wake up at that golden hour of 3 a.m., they're right in the middle of, of grief and anger. And they may have a little bit of both. And so that and it can be cortisol. But what makes our cortisol come up? What makes that our body make cortisol, the stress hormone, the grief and anger? So we're back to Chinese medicine, the ancient healing traditions. I I teach a course at Arizona. I developed actually the course and have taught it for almost 18 years. It's called Ancient Healings for, no, Ancient Medicine for, what is it called? <laughs> anyway, it's, it's holistic medicine. It's teaching the ancient, we changed the name is why I'm having trouble with it. Ancient Healing for Modern Times. And it's teaching Ayurvedic, traditional Chinese medicine, naturopathy, homeopathy, and indigenous medicine, plant medicines. What do all of those ancient healing traditions have in common? They went about it different ways. They treat it differently. They do different diets, different things, but they were treating the mind, the body, and spirit. So in that master's level course, I've got doctors and social workers, and they're all stress balls. They're there because they want to learn a little bit about these because their patients are coming in, doing some of it, and they don't know anything about it. But the beauty is at the end of the course, after those five weeks of you know these weekends, they themselves say, this changed my life. That's been an honor as well. Wow, that's amazing. And you're so interesting. And I want to learn so much more from you. And I, I also want to be respectful of your time. So before we say goodbye for now, and I really hope you'll come visit us here again. Absolutely. You're great. Where can people find you? How can they connect with you and get the healing from you and, and get help from you? <laughs> right. So Dr. Warden, so D-R-W-O-R-D-E-N at me.com is my website. But the office number is 480 Two two three three, and they can if they're in Arizona, they can be patients. But I will say, in this pandemic type of atmosphere that we've got, just asking for a resource consult, which means I'm going to treat you just like a patient. I'm going to look at your labs and look at everything. I'm going to do everything I was going to do anyway. It's just you don't have to be physically in the office for all the exam type things that we have to do in office. So that's the easiest thing. I've had patients. I have patients all over the world. And that's fun to get to part of their journey. And I, I hope I'll see you in person, meet you in person next time I'm in Arizona. Yes. You're amazing. Thank you so, so much. Thank you for the work that you do. You're amazing. Thank you. Well, your message <laughs> is, is real and true. Thank you. And thank you, listeners. Remember to exercise, get sunlight, music, think about a happy song, use pet therapy, breathe, meditate, relax and have a stellar life. This is Orion. Till next time. Thank you for joining me on my mission to light people up and change lives around the world. I hope today's conversation inspires you to step up, go after the life of your dreams, and be who you want to be. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to go to stellarlifepodcast.com for show notes, transcripts, and other cool stuff. And please subscribe, review, and help spread the word by sharing us on Facebook and Twitter. Have a lovely day, and I'll catch you on the next episode.